If you mention mind reading, clairvoyance, Yuri Geller's spoon bending, or any other such mystery, most scientists will say there's no such thing as the paranormal. They dismiss any reality other than the purely material world. On the BBC website, in an article entitled Psychology, the Truth About the Paranormal, the author assumes that Alan Turing, a 20th century computer and mathematics genius, must be wrong about telepathy. That Winston Churchill did not really see an apparition of President Lincoln while he was at the White House. Or that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle could have possibly communicated with spirits of the dead. He wrote, despite their razor-sharp thinking, they could not stop themselves from believing in the impossible. Well, impossible is a big assumption, and he fails to justify this view. Since he's a materialist, these important historical figures simply must be guilty of what he called fanciful superstition. Yet his article acknowledges that recent surveys show that around three-quarters of Americans accept the paranormal. So he must think their ideas are fanciful superstition too. And what he could have added was that in 2015, a survey of over 2,900 British people found a whopping 82% saying they believed in the paranormal. People wishing to trace the origins of psychical investigation might point to the 19th century hamlet of Hydesville in New York State as their starting point. This village is close to the town of Newark on the Erie Canal. The 31st of March 1848 is the date that many spiritualists cite as the beginning of their movement following the startling events that took place in this house, which by the way is no longer standing. John Fox and his family, consisting of his wife and three girls, lived here and endured inexplicable knockings from the walls and the doors, despite observers keeping a watch on them from both sides. A curious vibration accompanied the sounds, and Mrs Fox's hair turned grey in a week from the fright. Soon it was noticed the knockings followed Kate, aged 12, and Margaret, or Margareta, aged 15, who, using a code along the lines of one knock for yes and two knocks for no, communicated with a so-called spirit supposed to be haunting their home. To discover if the children were responsible for making these wrappings themselves, they were separated, they were stood on pillows, and they were insulated by standing on glass plates, and they were tested in every way that ingenuity could devise before a committee reported the impossibility of trickery. Using their tapping code, it was discovered that a peddler had been murdered in the house, and he claimed his body was buried in the cellar. Prior to the Fox family's occupation, the previous tenants were the Weakmans, and they also had been disturbed in this way. They tried to discover the cause of the noises, but without success. The best description of the peddler himself was provided by Lucretia Pulver, a servant of the Bells who'd lived there immediately before the Weakmans had. She had examined the goods that the peddler was selling. Interestingly, the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, said similar hauntings had occurred at his home too. But before the Fox family's efforts, nobody had established communication in the way the Fox family had. With the help of a man named William Dusler, the spirit gave his name as Charles B. Rosner. He claimed to be 31 years old when he was murdered by John Bell, and the murder took place when he and Bell were alone in the house. The maid, Lucretia Pulver, and Bell's wife were away at the time. In the summer of 1848, they dug down five feet in the cellar floor, and they found a plank. Digging deeper, they found pieces of crockery and evidence of quicklime and charcoal. Finally, they discovered human hair, part of a skull and some human bones. The cellar was dug up over and over again to satisfy sceptical minds. And about 50 years later, William Hyde, the owner of the house at the time, made further investigations and opened up a cavity in the cellar wall containing a skeleton minus part of the skull, and also a peddler's tin trunk. 
Since the original diggers found part of a skull, but no skeleton, it appears to substantiate the peddler's story that his body was buried in the cellar. But he failed to reveal that it was later sealed up in what was supposed to be a safer place. When news of this spirit communication got out, hundreds of inquirers came from miles around to test the knockings, asking questions answerable by yes or no. They denied the possibility of the Fox family producing their results by trickery. At the suggestion of a man called Isaac Post, the spirits were asked to give answers using the alphabet. When the correct letter was named by the living, the spirit would respond with a rap. This marked a stride forward, making possible more detailed information. It might be expected that uh, learning how spirits could communicate with the living would be hailed as a significant breakthrough, but the reverse proved to be true. The Fox family were treated with suspicion and derision. Their daughter, Leah, a music teacher, lost most of her pupils. So the Fox family begged the spirits to cease manifesting, but the reply came that public meetings should be held to prove the genuineness of spirits. When the family flatly refused to add to their troubles, the spirit intruders agreed to stop communicating. The two Fox sisters developed a career as travelling mediums, managed by their older sister, Leah. They were routinely exposed as fakes by sceptics claiming they produced their phenomena in ways ranging from toe, knee and ankle cracking to ventriloquism or the use of mechanical devices. Despite this, no trickery was discovered. Several committees were set up to test the sisters' powers, but even when they were trussed up for this purpose, the rapping sound still occurred and most committees admitted they could not detect fraud. Over the years, things went downhill for the Fox sisters. Margaret had had enough by 1888 and made an appearance to denounce spiritualism as a total sham. Years of alcohol abuse, loneliness and grief had taken their toll on her. She even considered committing suicide before choosing confession instead. In exchange for $1,500 from the New York World newspaper, she announced at the New York Academy of Music, shown here, that she and her sister Kate had created the strange wrappings in Hydesville by simply cracking their toes. She also stated that Leah, her other sister, had forced them into performing as mediums. I quote, I have seen so much miserable deception, she reported, that is why I'm willing to state that spiritualism is a fraud of the worst description. While the critics cried, I told you so, serious spiritualists denounced this confession as the ravings of a sad and tired drunk who had made the confession in return for a fee. Kate did not speak at this public appearance. She stated that she did not agree with her sister and she continued to perform as a medium. In 1891, Margaret even recanted her confession but by then nobody was interested. The damage had been done. Some people even said that Maggie renounced the movement simply to spite her sister Leah, whom they'd grown to hate. Kate later drank herself to death in July 1892, at the age of only 56, and Margaret died in March the following year, aged 59 and penniless. But the point of this story is that the Fox sisters' investigation at Hydesville had resulted in finding Charles Rosner's remains. From these beginnings, spiritualism grew into a worldwide movement, although charlatans damaged its reputation by taking the opportunity to fleece the gullible and the grieving. So does this story mark the origin of psychical research? Despite its empirical outcome, the answer is no. For that, we need to go further back. Emanuel Swedenborg was born on the 29th of January 1688 in Stockholm and became a very important figure in Sweden. He was a brilliant man, a scientist and engineer, a mathematician and metallurgist, a philosopher, astronomer, theologian and a prolific author. From 1743 he began to experience visions and dreams and he recorded them in his personal diary. 
by April 1745, Swedenborg now claimed to perceive unseen spiritual realms while he was still fully awake. Subsequently, he published books based on his experiences, and these are still available today. They include Heaven and Hell, Divine Love and Wisdom, Divine Providence, and True Christianity. Among his more controversial claims, one was that the Bible was not to be taken literally, and this resulted in his book Secrets of Heaven. But in addition to theological matters, Swedenborg was a practical clairvoyant. One evening in Gothenburg in July 1759, while attending a dinner party, he began to vividly describe a roaring fire bearing down on his home that very moment in Stockholm, over 400 kilometres away. Although visibly distressed, he eventually claimed relief that the fire was now under control and his home had survived the ordeal, stopping just three doors away from his own house. Two days later, men arrived from Stockholm with news that showed that Swedenborg had been correct. The first messenger was from the Board of Trade and the second was a royal courier. Both of them confirmed every statement to the precise hour that Swedenborg had made them. In the increasing wind, the fire had spread very quickly, damaging the church of Maria Magdalena, consuming about 300 houses and making 2,000 people homeless in the district of Södermalm. If Swedenborg had received this information by normal means, there would have been no psychic perception for history to record. Instead, when his catastrophic vision became known in Stockholm, he aroused a great deal of public curiosity. The following year, in 1760, a Madame de Marteville, the widow of a recently deceased Dutch ambassador to Sweden, was presented with a bill for a very expensive silver service her husband had bought. While she was sure that this bill had been paid, she could not find the receipt. So she requested Swedenborg's help. The following night he had a dream in which her husband revealed the location of the receipt in a secret compartment in a chest of drawers. This turned out to be accurate, thus preventing the lady from being cheated. I should add that there are different versions of this story, but they amount to the same outcome. And finally, Swedenborg was presented at court to Sweden's Queen Louisa Ulrika in 1761. Of Prussian birth, she was described as beautiful, intelligent, with a fierce temperament and a strong will. She decided to test him by asking him about the contents of a letter between herself and her brother, Prince Augustus William of Prussia, who had died in 1758. When Swedenborg returned to the court, he gave her an answer privately, upon which she was heard to exclaim that only her brother could possibly have known what Swedenborg had just told her. And she added, I am not easily fooled. So here was an eminent man with a proven psychic ability who intrigued not a few people. Among them was Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. In 1763, being impressed by these accounts I've just related, he sent his English friend Joseph Green to investigate. Visiting Swedenborg at home, Green found Swedenborg to be a scholar and a sensible, pleasant and open-hearted man. Subsequently, when asked for his own opinion of Swedenborg's abilities, Kant referred to his miraculous gift and described him as reasonable, agreeable, remarkable and sincere. However, three years later, Kant published a small book entitled Dreams of a Spirit Seer. It was a scathing critique of Swedenborg and his writings. Kant wanted to avoid mockery for seeming to be an apologist for Swedenborg and spiritism, since this might damage his own career. Quite what Swedenborg made of such duplicity we will never know. He died on the 29th of March 1772, an event that he'd predicted to the very day. But whatever Kant's views, Swedenborg nonetheless planted the seeds of paranormal exploration and research much earlier than the Fox sisters had done. However, we're nowhere near the truly ancient origins of psychical research. For this, we must go back 2,500 years. 
The first recorded parapsychology experiment that I know of took place in ancient Greece during the 6th century BC, and it involved Croesus, the king of Lydia. As the map shows, the nation of Lydia was the western half of modern-day Turkey. At that time, Greece was famous for its various oracles linked to the temples of various gods. Generally, a priestess would go into a trance and issue prophecies that were then interpreted by the priests. These people had prestige and political influence with kings and generals alike who would consult them on major issues. Herodotus, a contemporary of Socrates, is often referred to as the father of history. He reported that Croesus, the king of Lydia, enjoyed proverbial wealth. He reigned from 560 to 546 BC, and he wished to test the ability of seven different oracles. So he sent messengers to Abba and Miletus, to Dodona and Delphi, to Amphiara, Trophonius, and Jupiter Ammon. He wanted to consult the best of them about his proposed military campaign against the Persians. On the hundredth day after their departure from Sardis, the capital of Lydia, each messenger was to ask their oracle to report what Croesus was doing at that very moment. The oracle of Delphi was a priestess in the temple of Apollo, located on the slopes of Mount Parnassus. When the emissaries arrived, even before they'd had time to deliver their message, which had actually been kept secret, the priestess began speaking in verse, and here are two slightly different translations of what she said. Firstly, I count the grains of sand on the ocean shore. I measure the ocean's depths. I hear the dumb man. I likewise hear the man who keeps silence. My senses perceive an odour as when one cooks together the flesh of the tortoise and the lamb. Brass is on the sides and beneath, and brass also covers the top. This is the other translation. I know the sand's number and the measures of the sea. I understand the mute and hear him, though he does not speak. The smell has come to my senses of a hard-shelled tortoise being cooked in bronze together with lamb's meat. There is bronze beneath it, and with it bronze has been covered. To complicate his intended puzzle, the king of Lydia had sought an activity virtually impossible to guess. Cutting a tortoise and a lamb into pieces, he then cooked them together in a pan or cauldron with a lid of the same metal. So the oracle was accurate. The verse written down in Delphi was rushed to Croesus and received with great veneration. The oracle at Amphiaris also proved lucid in this experiment, but the other oracles were less so. So this first ever experiment in parapsychology had worked. King Croesus celebrated finding his accurate medium by sacrificing 3,000 animals of all kinds. He lit a bonfire and burned precious objects, and he sent to Delphi a string of over-the-top valuable gold and silver gifts. So now the king asked the oracle at Delphi whether he should go to war against the Persian Empire. And the reply came back, if Croesus goes to war, he will destroy a great empire. With this answer, Croesus made preparations to meet the Persian army. The battle was a draw. Croesus marched back home to Sardis, and the army disbanded for the winter. But eventually, Sardis fell to the Persians. Croesus' wife committed suicide, and Croesus himself was dragged in chains before King Cyrus of Persia. So an inquiry was sent to Delphi. Why had Croesus been betrayed? In reply, the oracle said, the truth had been spoken. An empire had been destroyed by Croesus, his own, and it was the king's fault if he misinterpreted the message. So what should we conclude from these three stories? Well, two and a half thousand years ago, there was clear evidence that clairvoyance works. The oracle knew what the king was doing on the day, regardless of its strangeness and the ultimate outcome. 250 years ago, Swedenborg was correct about a fire 250 miles away threatening his home. He also located a receipt lost in a secret place. 170 years ago, a spirit indicated accurately that his murdered body was in the cellar. 
it remains astonishing to me why people have blindly refused evidence available for two and a half thousand years. And there's far more evidence than I've mentioned in this programme. And why have they called the paranormal mere fanciful superstition? Do psychical abilities exist? Well, demonstrably, they do. So how long before materialist scientists finally take their heads out of the sand? Well, don't hold your breath, okay? <laughs> Thanks for listening.